Cue and Review, celebrating 40 years of audio production, welcomes you to this week's edition of the Glasgow Times Sports Podcast, recorded from our studio in the Bishop Briggs Media Centre and by our volunteers working from home. Keep up to date with Cue and Review news via our Facebook, Twitter or Instagram at Cue and Review, that's at sign C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W or get in touch with us directly by emailing information at qandreview.com that's I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at sign C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M or by calling 0141 772-3976 Please like and share our podcast and give us constructive feedback. Evening Times Sport, October 17. Scott Brown on Callum McGregor's Celtic and Scotland success. Report by David Irvin. There is a growing list of similarities between Scott Brown and Callum McGregor's playing careers. Both men have become synonymous with Celtic and the Scotland national team, but the current Parkhead captain still has a bit of catching up to do in his medal collection. One thing McGregor has the upper hand on, though, is surpassing Brown's international caps after making his 56 appearance for Scotland against Spain. And for Brown, there's plenty more to come from McGregor in Scotland colours. He's got a lot more left in him, said Brown, when quizzed on McGregor overtaking his 55 cap tally. It will be up to Callum and how his body is as well. But the wee man looks after himself and he is a top pro. He's always worried about what's next, what he can do to get better, and I think that's the way you need to be these days. There are probably a few more games than when we played, and we have the Nations League as well. Getting through that helps Scotland, which is huge. It's all about him being there and being reliable, and being that guy who wants to play for his country in every game. On the current Scotland squad, Brown added, It's definitely the best squad I've seen in a long time, because they've made the Euros. It's not by luck or us just making it. They have strolled through it and look like they can hold their own weight in the competitions as well. There is little doubt that Brown played a key role in McGregor's development, considering the correlation between their playing achievements. And while Brown does take pride in McGregor's development, he insists it's down to much more than just his tutelage. Said Brown, I wouldn't say I held his hand. I helped him through tough times when we both played together, and now he'll be doing the exact same to other lads. I've passed that on to him, and he has shown his qualities as well whether it's Champions League or in games against Rangers and St Johnston, he is that man everyone looks to make something happen. He's always had that in his locker, and he's grown into it over the years, and the expectation for being captain at Celtic has pushed his game on to another level. A lot of people could have gone under, but he's controlled himself, understood the role, and he's relished the challenge. Report by David Irvin. Evening Times Sport, October 17. Madrid trio said to be available to face Celtic. Report by Aidan MacDonald. Atletico Madrid trio, Pablo Barrios, Cagar Soyuncu, and Angel Correa are set to return in time for the Champions League clash against Celtic. This is according to Spanish outlet Diario AS, who claim that the three injured players are set to be available 
for this weekend's fixture against Kelta Vigo. Varius and Soyuncu missed the last month with muscle problems, while Correa has been struggling with a knee strain since the recent Madrid derby victory. However, all three look poised to be available for Diego Simeone's side when they travel to Glasgow for match day three. The Spanish Giants currently sit joint top of the group, along with Lazio, on four points. Report by Aidan MacDonald Evening Times Sport, October 17 Real Madrid star on Brendan Rodgers' Celtic transfer wish list. Report by Aidan MacDonald Celtic are interested in Real Madrid goalkeeper Andre Lunin. This is according to a report from the Daily Record, who claim the Ukraine international is one of several shot stoppers that the Hoop scouting team are watching and doing ongoing analysis on. The 24-year-old started the first two games of the season for the Spanish Giants but has not played since the arrival of Kepa Ariz Balaga on loan from Chelsea. Joe Hart's deal at Parkhead is up at the end of the season, and the Scottish champions currently have Scott Bain and Benjamin Segrist as backup options. Lunin joined Real Madrid in 2018, but most of his competitive minutes have come while on loan at Leganes. Valladolid and Oviedo. Meanwhile, Celtic hero Martin O'Neill has fired a warning to new Rangers boss Philippe Clement, saying the Ibrox boss must win immediately. The Belgian has joined the Light Blues on a three and a half year deal, and O'Neill was keen to address comments the 49 year old made in his first interview after landing the role. Clement spoke about things taking time at the start of his managerial process and the importance of inputting style of play. And the former Parkhead manager made clear that Clement must bring instant success, otherwise he will be under pressure. Speaking to TalkSport, he said, Just win some football matches. You have to overtake Celtic. It's as simple as that. That's what you have to do. You need to do that relatively quickly. That's the point. None of this, please don't come in and say, you have a three-year plan, or I want to see the youth players developed, which I think he might be able to do. But no, you have to win, and you win immediately. Report by Alistair MacDonald Evening Times Sport, October 17. Scotland squad qualification bonus revealed. Report by David Evan. Steve Clark's Scotland squad will reportedly split a near seven-figure prize pool after qualifying for Euro 2024. The national team sealed qualification to the tournament finals in Germany next year after Spain's win over Norway. It means both Scotland and Spain have qualified for Euro 2024 from Group A, with top spot still up for grabs in November. However, Scotland players have banked significant bonus payments as a result of achieving qualification. The Scottish Sun reports the Scottish FA does not pay players appearance monies, but instead bonus payments are agreed in advance for should the nation qualify for major tournaments. It is claimed a near £1 million pot will be shared amongst players who have been involved and payments will be dished out on a scale dependent on individual involvement. Manager Clark and his backroom team, including John Carver, Austin McPhee, James Morrison, Chris Woods and Graham Jones, are also expected to pocket bonus cash for the achievement. 
Meanwhile, the report goes on to state that the Scottish FA is hopeful of banking at least £6 million from qualification to Euro 2024 before further payments as part of hosting Euro 2028. On qualification to the Euro 24 finals in Germany, Clark commented, I would like to congratulate the players for their efforts in qualifying for back-to-back tournaments. I am not sure they will fully realise the significance of their achievement yet, but to qualify for successful Euros after more than 20 years is phenomenal and testament to their hard work. I would also like to thank my backroom team for their support and of course the fans who have packed Hamden Park to capacity and made it a place to be feared once again. They have played a key part in our success, both home and away, and they can now look forward to making their plans for Germany, although I suspect many had done so before tonight. I said after Euro 2020 that we wanted to be serial qualifiers again and reaching successive Euro finals shows the progress we have made. We will raise a glass to celebrate, but then it's back to work as we prepare for our friendly against France. Then we turn our attention to Georgia and Norway next month and finishing with as many points as we can. Report by David Irvin. Evening Times Sport, October 17. Todd Cantwell on first meeting Michael Beal. Report by Stuart Wilson. Rangers midfielder Todd Cantwell has opened up on his first meeting with former boss Michael Beal, explaining how the 43-year-old sold the Ibrox club to him. The Englishman joined the Light Blues in January from Norwich City and detailed the unique way Beal described the move. He explained that the now ex-Rangers manager called it a beautiful madness. Speaking to the Beautiful Game podcast, the 24-year-old said, I chose the footballing option and spoke to Michael and Ross Wilson, who was the sporting director, and I had conversations with a bit of back and forward for a couple of weeks. And do you know what? I met the manager in London and I was speaking to him and he was so passionate about football, about Rangers and passionate about me and I didn't have that for a little while. It was refreshing for me to have someone go, do you know how good you are? Do you actually know how good you are? Because for some reason you don't seem to feel or know that you are that person. And you know, the money option is lingering around, but it was a football option. And I thought, the way he sold Rangers to me is exactly what it is. Exactly what he said to me, it's going to be, is exactly what it is. It's beautiful, but it's a madness. And if you enjoy the madness, you'll be beautiful. And it was like, yeah, it's the right thing to do. So I spoke to him and decided... I signed about two weeks after my first contact. Report by Stuart Wilson Evening Times, October 18 Clark says Scotland have lots to improve after defeat to France. Report by Ronnie Esplin Steve Clark has told his Scotland players to stop this run of defeats next month after losing 4-1 to France in Lille. The Scots went into the friendly knowing they had qualified for the 2024 European Championships after Spain beat Norway at the weekend to ensure a top two finish in Group A. Scotland had lost 2-0 to Spain last week on the back of a 3-1 loss to England at Hampden Park in the 150th Heritage Anniversary match 
and the French were even classier. Clark made eight changes from Seville. Goalkeepers Liam Kelly and Xander Clark played a half each on their debuts. Scotland stunned the home side when midfielder Billy Gilmer guided in the opener after 11 minutes, his first ever senior goal. However, French defender Benjamin Pavard scored two headers. Skipper Killian Mbappe added a third from the spot before the break after a VAR intervention saw referee Tobias Steele judge Scotland defender Liam Cooper had held Olivier Giroud and substitute Kingsley Coleman hammered in a fourth. After victory in the first five Euro qualifiers, Scotland have lost three in a row and Clark wants to get that winning feeling back in the final two qualifiers against Georgia next month before the final game against Norway. He said, we can take away the memory of the qualification, but we lost two games in the camp. We don't like losing. I don't want them to be comfortable losing or happy to lose. We spoke about that after the game. It is important we set our standards higher than that. We have lost three in a row now, and I have asked them to make sure that when we get to Georgia, that we stop this run. We want to finish on the same points as Spain, so the target is to finish with 21 points, which will make it a good campaign. Clark, who was happy with his team selection, acknowledged the superiority of the home side and continued, I thought we started the game really well. The first 15 minutes was good and we got ourselves in front. To concede a goal from a corner was disappointing because we know France can score from open play and we try not to give goals away from set plays. The third goal, I don't think VAR should have got involved in the decision. It was soft and when the referee goes there, he has to be strong to stick with his original decision. Both players were at it and that takes the game away from us. The second half was okay, but France are always a threat with their pace and power and quality. So lots to learn, lots to improve. We know we are not at that level yet. It is a level we are going to strive to get to, and the harder we strive, the better team we will be. After sealing qualification to Euro 2024 with a 2-1 win over the Netherlands on Friday, France boss Didier Deschamps was happy to finish the camp off with a convincing win and said, It was a very good week. When you win, you are always happy. The most important thing was against the Netherlands on Friday night, and the fact that we have shown so much quality tonight as well. It is a great satisfaction for us. We created lots of chances against a team that can defend pretty well and has a lot of qualities, so we are very happy. Report by Ronnie Esplin Evening Times Sport, October 18 Steve Clark sets out Scotland Challenge Report by Ewan Payton Steve Clark says the nation will need to wait to see his smile following Scotland's qualification for next summer's European Championships. The manager watched on as a second string Scotland side were thumped 4-1 in France. Billy Gilmer had the Scots in the lead and strangely enough, despite the score, the visitors performed pretty well in Lille. However, France step up a few years and showed their top quality in the end. Clark insists his side will need to learn from their mistakes as they aim to take six points from the remaining six available in Group A of Euro 2024 qualifying next month. The manager admitted, It was always going to be a tough game for us. We started really well, but we conceded a goal from a corner. And when you play the top teams and they're capable of scoring from open play, 
you cannot concede of set plays. The first is a free header from a corner. So we'll look at that. We'll try and do better. The second is from a second phase of a set play. So we'll look at that as well. The third, which probably kills the game, was a really soft penalty. I don't know why VAR has to get involved. And I don't know why the referee is not strong enough to stick by his original decision, which was to let play go on. We wanted to win and perform well. With the ball, it was probably as well as we've played against a pot win team. We had good possession, but we didn't create enough high up the pitch until late in the game. Jacob Brown came off the bench and was lively. He was good. He was a threat. Stuart Armstrong had a big chance. Those moments in the game can make the scoreline look a little bit better. It's a different kettle of fish next month against two different teams. Going to Georgia now, we should be confident in the way that we've played in the group. We want six points. I've told them we want six points from the last two games. They have to go to Georgia and know that they're playing a good team, but they're not playing a top team. They have to show more on the ball and create more chances. You always have to defend well, but we've got to show that we've learned some lessons from these three top matches, England, Spain and France, all in the top 10 in the world. Difficult opponents. You need a squad. We've got a squad. And we've shown we've got some good players. When you lose two wing backs in Hickey and Robertson, it's difficult. The back three, by and large, defended quite well. Lewis Ferguson was very good. Scott McTominay and Billy Gilmer had their moments. Kenny did well. It was a difficult night for whoever was the forward because we didn't get quick enough support to them. I saw some things that I liked and I saw some things that I didn't like. I'll go away and study the videos of the last three games against the top opponents to try and give the boys some help so that we are the top team next month and we come out with the victories. You never smile after you get beaten. I'm just disappointed. They were dangerous every time they had the ball. They are a top team. Their one versus ones are incredible. You can be in a good shape and they've got players who can go past a defender. And that creates a whole different ball game. Report by Ewan Payton Evening Times Sport, October 18, Rugby. Time to scrap charging down laws, says Martin Hannan. Never has there been so much controversy over so little that was so important. Charging down a conversion attempt has long been a part of rugby union's laws, but I am glad that since France lost to South Africa by the odd point in 57 in the World Cup quarter-final in Paris on Sunday, that people are now questioning if that rugby law is an ass. It is, and I am calling for the law to be scrapped and replaced with conversions from anywhere the kicker wants with no attempts to interfere by the opposition. Let's examine the facts of what happened. He is a superstar of world rugby, and he proved it with his overall performance against France. But Cheslin Colby is not unique in charging down a conversion. Yes, it is very rare for such an eventuality to happen in elite-level rugby but you see it quite a lot in the junior level. Since the weekend, there has been a growing clamour for Colby's action to be overturned, mostly by the French fans who dug up some footage that shows that Colby broke from behind the goal line to confront Thomas Ramos before the French fullback 
had started his run-up to take the kick. Having viewed it many times, I agree that Colby broke it early because he would have needed to be Usain Bolt at his peak to cover the distance in such a short time. Colby is very fast, but not that fast. His charge down was illegal, and the conversion should have been allowed to be retaken. That the illegality was not picked up was the fault of the match officials, and like so much of the refereeing at this World Cup, that was down to sheer incompetence other than bias, unconscious or otherwise. In any case, had the conversion attempt not been charged down, Ramos may well have missed the kick at goal, so it is frankly ludicrous to ask for the result to be overturned. It was very clever play by Colby to make his first ever conversion charge down, as he was familiar with Ramos's kicking action from their time together at Toulouse. He may well have done so legally, but the footage available on social media was very damning. Though did some French geek alter it with AI or something? That's the way you have to think these days. Rugby's laws are definite. Once the match is over, you cannot alter the result, even with so much at stake. What needs to be changed is the conversion law itself. Ask yourself, what would you rather see? A forward rumble to score under the post? or a blistering multiplayer move, or piece of individual brilliance that sees a try achieved far out on the wing. Yet the score under the post is rewarded with an easy conversion, almost an automatic seven points, while the more entertaining score only earns a kick at goal from a wide angle that is always missable. In the true spirit of rugby, Tries should be rewarded equally, no matter where they are scored. After all, why is a try called a try? As any rugby buff would tell you, it's because when the laws were made back when Queen Victoria was on the throne, the aim of the game was to touch the ball down over your opponent's goal line to earn the right to try a kick at goal. Personally, I have always thought it was completely bonkers that players are allowed to run at conversion kickers. If you don't stand still at a penalty attempt, the referee can order a retake. But there's no such protection for those trying to earn the extra two points for their team. It is illogical. It's nuts. And world rugby should start with an immediate ban on the practice before moving to a new conversion law, as I have suggested. I am not just mentioning the Colby incident because my te- personal tips for the trophy exited at the hands of the world champions. Last week I predicted a final between Ireland and France, and while the former disappointed with the All Blacks defending magnificently, and clearly outsmarting the world's number one side, a ranking they have duly lost, I felt France should have won their match comfortably, and they let the Springboks back into the game too easily. On the form they showed at the weekend, New Zealand are a shoe-in against Argentina on Friday, while the other semi-final on Saturday is a repeat of the 2019 World Cup final, and I expect the same result. The Springboks have a better team than four years ago, and England have regressed. I remind you that the man who clinched the match for South Africa with the second try of the game was none other than Cheslin Colby. He didn't have to charge down any English conversion attempts, because they did not get any, and I don't think they will this time either. Report by Martin Hannan Evening Times Sport, October 19, 
Aston Villa prospect praises former Rangers teammates. Report by Stuart Wilson. Aston Villa youngster Rory Wilson has praised Rangers stars Alex Lowry and Leon King after Scotland under-21's recent victory over Malta, calling them both top class. The 17-year-old, along with the two light blues players, featured the Scott Gemmell side won both of their Euro 2025 qualifiers at Fir Park, and Wilson, who came through the Ibrox Academy, had nothing but good things to say about both. He said, Leon and Alex are both top class, and you can see the quality they both have. Leon just takes everything in his stride. He's a top player who handles it brilliantly. Wilson joined the Premier League side from Rangers last July and has already made a significant impact across several youth teams. The striker is now a regular with the Aston Villa under-18s and feels the quality of the players he is training with daily has allowed him to develop his game. He continued, It's a really strong squad. I need to keep pushing on. And if I get the opportunity, just try my best. Obviously, the standard down there is top drawer, especially with the first team. There are world-class players everywhere. What you hear about is what you get. But that's what you want. It's up to me to push myself. It took me a bit of time at first to settle in, because you are away from your family for the first time. But you get used to it. You have to get on with it and take it in your stride. Report by Stuart Wilson Evening Times Sport October 19 Atletico Madrid Handed major injury boost. World Cup winner Nahuel Molina has received the all clear to play against Celtic next week in the Champions League as the Atletico Madrid defender recovered from injury. Celtic play the La Liga Giants as they aim to try and get their first points in the group stages after defeats to Feyenoord and Lazio. Molina is widely regarded as one of the best right-backs in the world after helping his country to triumph in Qatar. He played in all six games and scored the opening goal against the Netherlands in the quarter-finals, which Argentina won on penalties. But he was sidelined with a thigh strain for his country's World Cup qualification win over Peru during the week and rated a major doubt for the game in Glasgow on Wednesday. However, Atletico have now given the green light to return to training, and he was named in the squad list for their weekend game at Celta Vigo. Inform Atletico are aiming for their fifth La Liga win in a row at the weekend. Report by Mark Walker Evening Times Sport October 19. Clark responds to Anderson and Barnes Scotland call-up poser. Report by David Irvin. Steve Clark has revealed discussions over national team call-ups for Harvey Barnes and Elliot Anderson are not a conversation for him going forward. The national team boss has previously pitched the opportunity to train with Scotland to both players, however neither has pulled on the dark blue. Instead, Anderson joined the squad for training ahead of the match against Cyprus, before pulling out days later. Now, after qualifying for Euro 2024, Clark was again quizzed on potential to draft the pair into the Scottish fold but he stopped the conversation after defeat to France, instead hailing his already impressive Scotland pool. On possible additions, he told the Scottish son, You are always looking, but everyone's always trying to get me to pick other people. I like the squad I've got. I like what they give me. 
and what they give their country. I like the fact they turn up every time, and sometimes they don't get minutes on the pitch, and yet they still come, and they still support the rest of the lads. So I like what I have, but I'm never going to close my eyes and ears to something or someone that might improve us in the future. Further pressed on Anderson and Barnes' chances at joining the Scotland squad, Clark replied, It's not a conversation for now. Barnes is out for three months. He's injured. That's not a conversation for tonight. It's not really a conversation for me going forward. Like I say, I like the squad I've got. I don't close my eyes and my ears to possible additions. But we will see what happens. Report by David Irvin. Evening Times Sport, October 19. Lewis Ferguson's tough Rangers release. Report by Ewan Payton. Barry Ferguson has detailed the despair his nephew Lewis faced following his release by Rangers as a youngster. The Scotland international did not let that setback from his boyhood heroes stop him though, with the midfielder's career going from strength to strength. Former Ibrox skipper Ferguson has backed the Bologna star to earn another big money move in the near future. The 24-year-old came through the ranks at Rangers as he followed in his uncle Barry and his dad at Derek's footsteps at Ockenhowe. Things that did not work out in the Rangers Academy for Ferguson though, as he then joined Hamilton. He gained vital first team experience in Lanarkshire before joining Aberdeen and subsequently Bologna. He started for the national side as Steve Clark's side lost 4-1 to France. And Barry reckons it won't be long before his nephew kicks on again, as he reflected on the adversity he faced as a teenager. He told Go Radio's football show, Listen, it was tough for him as a young boy, getting let go by Rangers. That was his team. You could go one or two ways. He decided to go to Hamilton. He worked hard and forced his way in as a young boy and did really well by getting that move to Aberdeen. I think Derek McInnes was a big factor in his career. He was brilliant with him and put him straight into the Aberdeen first team. He's very mature and speaks better than his dad and his uncle, that's for sure. He's very grounded and he's made that move to Italy. He's gone to a different country, out of his comfort zone and settled very quickly. Last year he had a really good season and this year they've made him captain in the last three games. So that tells you how far he's come as a footballer and as a human being. I just hope he keeps improving and if he keeps playing the way he is at this moment, I'm not being disrespectful to Bologna, but I don't think he'll be there much longer. Could he be in England? Yes, he's one of those guys where it's right for him. He'll go. He's proven he's not scared to go to a different country. It's scary. He's gone over there himself. And now his girlfriend and young baby are over with him. But to go out there yourself, it takes a look and he's gone and done it. And proven what a real good footballer he is. Report by Ewan Payton. Evening Times Sport, October 19. Naismith responds over Hearts Celtic away allocation. Report by Aidan Smith. Hearts manager Stephen Naismith has broken his silence on the Tynecastle club's decision to cut Celtic's allocation for this weekend's Scottish Premiership clash. In recent seasons, the Edinburgh outfit have cut tickets for away supporters, barring Hibs who still receive the whole Roseburn stand for Derby fixtures. 
As a result, Celtic have been handed just 576 tickets for this weekend's Premiership fixture. And Brendan Rodgers has spoken of his disappointment in the allocation. In response, Naismith told Sky Sports, Celtic will have their view, just like we have our view, with what we get when we go to away grounds. Over the last five or six years, the momentum has been building for the club in general. Whether that be with the new stand being built, the backing the club have got, or the foundation of the fans taking control of the club. All the optimism comes with creating a bigger following and, first and foremost, we need to look after our fans and give them the opportunity to support us. As a country, we can look around at other leagues and see the way things are done. There are so many aspects of the game in Scotland that we can improve. But every club is looking out for themselves, and rightly so, to give their fans the best opportunity to watch their team. On the match itself, Naismith added, You are testing yourself against some of the teams that are going to be challenging for the league. They are inevitably tough games and the approach is different in terms of how much you are going to have the ball. They are fantastic games to play in and we've got a cup semi-final. As a club, that's where we want to be. It will be an intense month, but it's one you want to be involved in. Speaking earlier this week, Rogers explained, It's always a difficult place to go, Tyne Castle. However, we'll relish the game. It should be a great atmosphere. Sadly, again, I don't think there are many tickets for our supporters. So we'll have to go there without our same support. However, we've shown already this season that we can go into venues that are tough venues and get the results that we need. So we want to get in there and perform well and fingers crossed we get all the players back from international duty healthy and fine and throughout the week we can do our preparation and we'll look forward to that game on Sunday. Evening Times Sport October 19 Neil McCann tipped to fill new Rangers coaching role Report by Ewan Payton Barry Ferguson has tipped Neil McCann to take up a coaching role at Rangers. New manager Philippe Clement yesterday revealed that he would shape his backroom staff at the club in the next few weeks. Stefan van der Heiden will be brought in as assistant boss. That much has been confirmed. But Clement said during his unveiling that he would be looking to add someone to his coaching team with a strong knowledge of Scottish football. Stephen Davis was helped by Alex Ray and Stephen Smith as he took interim charge of the club following Michael Beale's sacking. It remains to be seen if the trio could play a part in the first team fold moving forward. And Ferguson believes his old teammate McCann would be the ideal fit for what Clement is looking for. He told the Go Radio Football Show, I like that because he's not showing an arrogance that he's going to bring his staff in. He understands he needs somebody who's got the knowledge of Scottish football, who's been to places like Tynecastle, Easter Road and Petaudry. One that jumps out at me would be Neil McCann. I think he would be perfect for it. Davo is still trying to get back from his serious knee injury. I don't know how that's going on, but I think in time Davo will become a coach or a manager. I think the club are definitely going to go down that route. And I think it's important that you have people round about the club who have been there, seen it and done it. It will be interesting to see who it's going to be. He says he's going to take his time, which I think is the right thing to do. Report by Ewan Payton. 
Evening Times Sport, October 19. Scales probably wanted out of Celtic. Report by Aidan MacDonald. Liam Scales might have wanted out of Celtic in the summer, but that just shows how remarkable his turnaround has been. That is according to former Republic of Ireland International and St Johnson's star David McMillan. He has been very impressed with the defenders' performances for the Hoops so far this season. McMillan told the RTE Soccer podcast, It is an amazing story for him. I saw Brendan Rogers' comments recently that he's kind of one of the surprise players he has ever come across. I think Liam himself probably wanted out of Celtic in the summer to go and play football and did not expect to get games there with the competition. He had obviously a good second half of the season with Aberdeen last year, and injuries at Celtic have given him an opportunity to come in, and he has obviously impressed his manager. To be playing in those games in the Champions League, it's a phenomenal level to be playing at, and it's very rare that now, at the moment, to have any Irish player doing that, as he's the only one playing in the Champions League. It's a brilliant story for any young League of Ireland player, starting at the UCD like myself, and going on and doing so well for Shamrock Rovers, and then proving himself at the top level in the Scottish Premier League and in the Champions League, and to get those first caps. It's a real good story. Report by Aidan MacDonald. Evening Times Sport, October 20. Why Motherwell have a big call to make on Liam Kelly? Report by Graeme McGarry. It was great to see Liam Kelly and Harry Payton representing their countries at full international level for the first time during the break, with the keeper playing for Scotland in the first half of the defeat to France and Peyton getting game time in Canada's friendly against Japan. Not only will the experience of coming up against such a high standard of opposition help both players individually to improve, but their exposure at international level will also to look at in a slightly more cynical way, potentially bump up their value as assets to Motherwell. In Kelly's case though, the chances of realising his full value to the club is hampered somewhat by his contract situation, with his current deal set to expire at the end of the season. The 27-year-old has had his ups and downs while at Fir Park. There is no doubt, for instance, that his form dipped considerably last season as the team collectively struggled in the latter stages of Stephen Hamill's reign at the club. But on the whole, he has been a hugely successful signing for Motherwell, both for his abilities on the field as a keeper and for his leadership both on and off the pitch, as club captain. Even at the nadir of his mother career, the abysmal Scottish Cup defeat to Wraith Rovers that ended Hamill's stint in charge, and where he was culpable for at least one of the goals, it was Kelly who fronted up after the match and faced the media to address the concerns of the fans. I was among the press that day at Starts Park, and there could be no doubting how much he was hurting at the predicament the club was in then. But he took on that responsibility, and along with the rest of the squad, followed up those words with actions when Stuart Kettlewell took over. Kelly, like his teammates, was vastly improved towards the end of the season, and this term he is getting back close to the hugely impressive levels he showed when he first came to Fir Park from Queen's Park Rangers. 
He is clearly highly thought of within the game, with Scotland manager Steve Clark not only picking him for squads on a regular basis, but trusting him to start Tuesday night's match against Kylian Mbappé et al. in Lille. It is just a shame he didn't manage to get a little more than his fingertips to Paris Saint-Germain's superstar's penalty kick, or his value may well have shot up even more. But the start for his country is not only an endorsement of his abilities from Clark, but a signal to any potential suitors that he has the temperament to handle playing in such company. All of which rather brings into focus the need for Motherwell to try to get Kelly tied down on a new contract as soon as it is humanly possible. There is no doubt Kelly loves life at the club. He has spoken more than once about how he has found a home at Fir Park. But if he does sign a new deal, then Motherwell fans may feasibly be able to look forward to having a solid number one on the books for a number of years to come. Realistically though, and perhaps more importantly, it would protect his value. Kelly is now a full Scotland international, who at 27 is theoretically coming into his peak years as a goalkeeper. It would be something of a disaster on a purely financial level if such a sellable asset was allowed to walk out the door next summer for nothing. If the club have sounded him out about signing a new deal, and he is of a mind to explore other options, as is his right, then a big decision awaits in January. Do the club try to sell him on then, in mid-season, in order to at least generate a little money from his departure. With Aston Oxborough looking solid enough in his runouts in the League Cup during the summer, that may be the time to cash in, providing there is interest out there. Far preferable, though, would be a situation where Kelly signs a new deal, and if he does eventually move on, Motherwell can be recompensed for providing the platform that took him from the Queen's Park Rangers bench to the Scotland squad. Report by Graeme McGarry Evening Times Sport, October 20 Mackay Stephen Contrack at Kilmarnock Chances Addressed Report by Ewan Payton Gary Mackay Stephen is bidding to win a contract at Kilmarnock. The 33 year old has spent the last two weeks training with the Rugby Park outfit after he asked Derek McInnes for the use of training facilities. The Kelly boss was only too happy to oblige, having worked with the former Dundee United and Celtic winger at Pitaudry. Mackay Stephen played just six games for Hearts last season. He suffered a broken foot last December and he endured a setback in his recovery towards the summer. While he was released by the Tynecastle Club, they did allow him to continue his rehab in recent months. McInnes insists it is too early to be discussing a deal with the PC attacker. However, he has impressed during his short stint in Ayrshire so far. Fans who attended yesterday's open training session were able to catch a glimpse of Mackay Stephen in action as he joined the rest of the first team in their preparations for this weekend's home game against Livingston. So it is certainly no secret that he's on the radar of Kelly. McInnes admitted he's been in this week and last week. Obviously, I've worked with Gary before. I spoke to his agent in the summer and he was still coming back from his foot injury at Hearts. He's been in at Hearts training, even though he's not under contract, and then just been keeping in touch. Then a couple of weeks ago, Gary reached out to me 
and asked for training facilities, and we were glad to help him. I need to say he's been terrific. He's trained every day. He looks good, and he's shown his qualities. You would have seen that if you saw any training. So we're really pleased to get him in and help him out. But it is just a case of that at the minute. Nothing more than that. It is still early days for Gary to be thinking about anything. It's just helping him out and getting him back to fitness. I don't want to put any extra pressure on him. The two of us have been pretty relaxed about it. Kyle McGuinness has the same agent, and I asked him about Gary's situation in the summer, and he just said he had a wee bit of a setback with the operation on his foot. He had what to do to get that sorted, but he's been back doing a lot of work at Hearts, individually with the physios there. He was then ready to go into a team set up in training, and we were glad to offer that. He still has that quality, and he still looks young. I look at him and still think he's the same young boy, even though Wikipedia tells me he's not. But his quality has never been in doubt, and he has looked terrific. The manager reflected on their time together in the North East, and he added, We had a good time working together previously. He was great for me at Aberdeen and I was disappointed to lose him when he went to the States. We were probably up against it in terms of the finances and the lifestyle part of it. At the time, I thought maybe it was the wrong move, as we ha would have got him into the Scotland set-up. He went out there, and I'm not saying that he lost his way, and it was quite rewarding for him out there, but it was maybe just a wee bit out of sight, out of mind but obviously he is someone that has something to offer. Kelly will be aiming to win their first Premiership match since the opening weekend of the season tomorrow. David Martindale's side sits three points ahead of the Rugby Park outfit in mid-table, with three out of the next five games scheduled to be in Ayrshire. Kelly must start to pick up more points if they are to have any hope of climbing the table to compete for the top six positions. McInnes said, We had a meeting with the players. We have played 14 games in all competitions, won five, drawn five and lost four. That probably tells you the story. Just a bit okay. We've had some good highlights and illustrated what we are capable of with some really good results and bit highs. I don't think we've had any really poor performances. We've always been okay in the games, but okay does not get the job done. We have spoken to the players about trying to give a bit more, concentrate a bit harder in certain moments, limit mistakes, and hopefully we'll get a few more wins in the next period of games. We have five before the next international break, and by that time, We'll have played everyone in the league, and it is important we don't wait until February or March next year to really grab the bull by the horns. Report by Ewan Payton Evening Times Sport October 20 Cantwell and Danilo back in train at Rangers Report by Aidan Smith. New Rangers boss Philippe Clement has been handed a double injury boost ahead of his first match as manager this weekend. The 49-year-old became the 19th permanent manager of the Govan club following the departure of Michael Beale at the start of the month. The former Genk and Club Bruges boss will manage his first match as Ibrox boss this weekend as Rangers welcome Hibs to Glasgow. And ahead of the clash, Clement has been able to welcome Todd Cantwell and Danilo back into his squad after the pair missed a number of games through injury. Danilo was spotted in training today, wearing a blue face mask as he continues to recover from a cheekbone injury sustained against St Johnston last month. 
Cantwell was ruled out after picking up a knee injury against Celtic in the first derby showdown of the season. Speaking ahead of his first game in charge, Clement said, I want to win everything. That's the mentality when I step into a building. I want to give this mentality towards the dressing room and create more and more winners in the dressing room. Report by Aidan Smith Evening Times Sport October 20 SPFL revenues and fee payments hit highest in league history. Report by Kirsty Dorsey. Latest annual accounts for the Scottish Professional Football League, the SPFL, show a 6% increase in turnover to £41.9 million, the highest in the league's history. Fee payments to clubs during the year to May 31 also rose to a record £31.7 million, an increase of 7% from the previous year, while total distributions to clubs reached a new high of £35.8 million, up by 6%. This was in addition to the net gate receipts of £2.6 million, distributed to the four clubs participating in the Viaplay Cup semi-finals and final at the National Stadium. SPFL Chief Executive Neil Doncaster said, This is the first time SPFL turnover has broken the £40 million figure. In tandem with record fee payments to clubs of £31.7 million, these are by far the strongest figures we have achieved in the 10-year history of the SPFL, especially in light of the ongoing economic challenges. Today's figures are testament to the continuing popularity of Scottish football and the growing demand from broadcasters and other partners. These record figures have been driven primarily by increases in the values of our partnerships with Sky Sports, BBC Scotland, Infront and Football Data Co and reflect the unique passion and drama of the Scottish game. The SPFL said since Premiership clubs will benefit from higher UEFA solidarity payments which last year amounted to £3.6 million as a result of the recent success of Scottish clubs in European competitions and the increase in funding by UEFA of such payments. Murdoch McLennan, SPFL chairman, said, These very encouraging results continue the strong trend of year-on-year improvements over the first decade of the SPFL and reflect a great deal of hard work and cooperation between SPL staff and our 42 clubs. Driving value back to our member clubs is our central role, and I am very confident that, working with the clubs across all four divisions, the SPFL is well placed to continue its strong performance in the years ahead. Report by Kirsty Dorsey. Evening Time Sport, October 20. Sparta Prague, major boost ahead of Rangers showdown. Report by Mark Walker. Sparta Prague have been given a boost ahead of their Europa League tie with Rangers next week after boss Brian Prisk was handed a new deal. Philippe Clement will take charge of his first European game with Rangers on Thursday when they travel to the Czech Republic to face Sparta. Rangers beat Real Betis before losing in Cyprus to Aris Limassol and Sparta also have a win and a draw in their opening two games in the section and they have rewarded Danish boss Prisk and two of his staff with new three-year deals after they won the Czech title last season. 
Sparta sports director, former Arsenal hero Thomas Riziki, said, We found the right person in Brian, who we believe will bring more success to Sparta. His expertise, passion and identification with Sparta is evident at first sight. For the future, this brings us stability and we continue on the path we have set for ourselves. We believe that Brian will win another title for Sparta, that he will continue to develop our players and that we will also be able to win European matches against quality opponents in the future. Priska added, I feel very happy in Sparta, so it was easy for me to accept the offer to continue working together. I like how the club accepts me, how my work is evaluated here. I see how the club works. I still see a lot of room for further progress. We all look to the future with the same goals. Thanks to the involvement of all the people in the club, we were able to connect two cultures, Czech and Danish. We all really worked hard and we have further challenges ahead of us. Report by Mark Walker. From the Glasgow Times of the 23rd of October 2023. The Opinion. Can Philippe Clement mould Rangers to stop Celtic? An article by Johnny McFarlane, Head of Digital Sport. When Philippe Clement walked into Rangers as manager last week, the altruist team that normally accompanies a blue room unveiling felt oddly missing. While the Belgian is just the 19th man to take the job, there can be little doubt the regularity that new faces have held the title in recent years has dulled the impact of epoch change. Since the appointment of Mark Warburton just over eight years ago, Rangers have had six different managers in eight years. Only Stephen Gerrard has lasted longer than two seasons, and the interruption of Covid saved his bacon during a horrific spell of form that included a home defeat to Hamilton and a quarter-final Scottish Cup loss to Hearts in his second term. Talking to Rangers fans, there was a general reluctance to get too enthused about even some with an, someone with as an impressive a CV as Clement, a three-time title winner in his home country. It was a case of twice bitten. After all, both Giovanni van Bronckhurst and Michael Beale arrived with strong backing from the support, having traversed the marble staircase before in times of success as a player and coach, respectively. Clement arrives with no such backstory, and that's one of the aspects that makes his arrival in Glasgow so interesting. How he will, how he will adapt to Rangers' culture is as important as his credentials as a football thinker, and is clearly a smart cookie, giving his engineering degree and excellent English. It was no surprise to see him emphasise winning over all else from the first moment of his arrival, saying my short-term and long-term targets are always to win. I am about that. That is my life. It has always been my life. Well, the club will want to see entertaining football that keeps the fans gripped, especially after the sedate spectacle of the season so far. All that really matters is three points, rise and repeat. As Rangers power brokers have found this season, already you can do lots of good things off the park, but if such work isn't done in tandem with having a winning team, you might as well have not bothered. Clement has been wise to grasp this most important of messages, something intrinsically tied to the DNA of his new club. If he arrives to something of a mystery, it's one that's unravelled a touch now. The media has sat with him for six separate briefings across five days, and we now have the evidence of 90 minutes of football to ponder. Face to face, he's been both warm and intense, and precisely worded questions are already drawing blunt answers, and a stare that lets you know without words precisely what he's thinking. While Beale was a natural raconteur who often exuded a boy's joy in just talking about the beautiful game, Clement is much more guarded. A couple of times already he's stated the answer to a probing question is not for public consumption. To use the parlance of a certain Mr Cantina, in an environment where every sardine that throws into the sea is gobbled up by hungry seagulls, you'd have to say it's probably a wise plan. 
But that's not to say he's been afraid to share insight or detail. He gave fascinating background into his assessment. The current squad lacks the fitness he requires. While it's true to say such claims are a new manager cliché, it's rare for the reasoning behind said opinion to be put to the public in such detail. Clement insists a more individualised training methodology will challenge Rangers' fittest stars, pushing them to new heights, while preventing the weaker ones from breaking down. Time will tell if it works, but there's no doubt that getting this squad injury-free is the key to unlocking its quality. Even with many out or unable to complete 90 minutes, Saturday's 4-0 win over Hibs was undoubtedly Rangers' best performance of the season. For his part, Clement Wood didn't want to get carried away. When asked what impressed him about the performance, he replied, Impressed is a big word. I'm happy with the result. Rangers were excellent in the game, especially in the con- in context of the season so far. They were full of running, tigerish in the press and got forward at will. Clement says he wants to see verticality in the team. Coaching talk for getting the ball forward quickly and that idea was clearly evident. That said, Hibbs' approach to the game certainly helped their opponents. Nick Montgomery started in a 4-4-2 with lightning wingers Martin Boyle and Ellie Yohan on the flanks. Clearly sensing blood in the water after recent disasters, Rangers might have been bruised in of late, but rarely are they troubled going toe-to-toe with domestic opponents at home. It may be another picture merges entirely when facing a team with five men across the back line and a bank of four in front. These are the games that have cost Rangers in recent years, and ensuring the creative depth to burst such blocks will be the bread and butter of Clement's tenure. And yet, even if he solves the issue, the league title is already likely to end up with Celtic. After a wobbly spell, they are clearly now finding their shape as Brendan Rodgers sighed and looked to have adapted to the end of the Ange Postecoglou era. As they showed with an easy 4-1 win at Tyne Castle yesterday, the Parkhead side are already too far ahead and too clinical for the league to be recovered without some sort of miracle for the light blues. The Cups are therefore where Clement can find joy. While his team's League Cup record in recent years is no reason to be confident, Winning that trophy can be an obvious point to turbocharge his reign. The Scottish Cup can then become a marker for next season, while Europe is not to be dismissed, although defeat in Cyprus means qualification will require some big performances. That said, get through the group stages, and we know from past experience that anything can happen in that competition. A run to the latter stages alongside domestic cup success would stand as tangible progress, with next season offering the chance of a proper tilt at the championship from the start. The pathway to success is there, even without a title this term. While the Clement era may not have begun with the fanfare hubris of those epochs gone, the early signs suggest a manager of genuine substance has arrived. That article, as we said, was by Johnny McFarlane, the head of Digital Sport. You can contact Johnny on Twitter, for, now known as X, at J-O-N-N-Y-R-M-C-F-A-R-L-A-N-E. From the Glasgow Times of the 23rd of October 2023, Celtic hero Chris Sutton names three Rangers stars in his team of the week. An article by Aidan Smith, Sports Audience and Engagement Editor. Chris Sutton has named his Scottish Premiership Team of the Week and surprisingly named a three Rangers star in his 11. The light blues thumped Hibernian in Philippe Clement's first game as manager and the Ibrox club looked far more impressive than they have done over the course of the season so far. As a result, certain hero Sutton could not ignore the city rivals when naming his top performers of the week in the daily record. Giving his take on the weekend's action, he said, Kyle Vassell bullied Livingston and the skipper's two goals were key to Kilmarnock's win. Teammates Danny Armstrong and David Watson also shone. 
Abdullah Sima maintained his excellent recent scoring run for Rangers, and there was a rare strike for the impressive Nicholas Raskin. James Tavernier played well in defence, as did Celtic pair Liam Scales and Greg Taylor in the hammering of hearts. Matt O'Reilly was magnificent as Celtic restored their seven-point lead in the title race with teammate Rio Hattat, that's H-A-T-A-T-E, also influential. Xander Clark lost four goals, but he also made a couple of cracking saves. Chris Sutton's Premiership TOTW, GK Xander Clark of Hearts, RCB James Tavernier of Rangers, CB Liam Scales of Celtic, LCB Greg Taylor of Celtic, CM Nico Raskin Rangers, CM David Watson Kilmarnock, CM Matt O'Reilly Celtic, CM Rio Hatat Celtic, RW Danny Armstrong of Kilmarnock, LW Abdullah Sima of Rangers, and ST Kyle Vassal of Kilmarnock. That article, as we said, was by Aidan Smith, Sports Audience and Engagement Editor. From the Glasgow Times, published on the 22nd of October 2023, Glasgow Warriors claim record Leinster win on special night for Horn. An article by Ewan Booth Robertson, rugby writer. Glasgow Warriors made an impressive start to the United Rugby Championship campaign with an emphatic 43-25 win over Leinster as George Horn capped his 100th appearance in style. Glasgow scored seven tries, a club record against Leinster, to highlight their billing as one of the favourites in the competition, with the highlight Horn's try less than a minute after his introduction. It was a special moment for the 28-year-old as he raced clear to score and he celebrated poignantly. Leinster were without their Ireland contingent from the World Cup and it showed. The Irish Giants improved in the second half but Glasgow combined attacking flair with defensive grit to fully deserve their win and head coach Franco Smith landed Centurion Horn. I'm ecstatic for him, Smith said. To play his 100th game and win it, not everybody gets that on accolade day. Good people make good players and he's an absolute pleasure to work with. I said to him that the plan was for him to come in and bring that energy he always brings. So that was the strategy in the second half of the game and he delivered as he always does. A year ago we started off differently, so we're just going to take the positive out of this game. I think... I think we needed to show that we are resilient in defence, and we did that. The hit out against Ulster helped us. There is one side of the game which sometimes in Glasgow is is neglected because we are a high-paced and attacking team, so really excited about that. It's in our DNA to score tries. I was asked during the week about what needs to get better, and one of them is definitely our defence. We defended much better last season, but didn't always get the reward on the board for that. Even tonight, although I thought we were exceptional in the number of tackles we made, we still left a few tries, which I think we could have prevented. Glasgow made a bright start on their competitive return, with Stafford McDowell prominent. The host twice opted to kick to the corner, rather than at the post, from penalties in the opening ten minutes. But their bold approach failed to pay dividends, as Lenser's robust defence held strong. Glasgow dominating the, dominated the opening stages and they were finally rewarded in 16 minutes when Josh Mackay scored the opening try after impressive work from Rory Darge. The Scotland flanker burst through the Leinster defence and offloaded for Mackay to ease in under the post with Tom Georgian adding the simple conversion. Leinster's advances into the Glasgow 22 were sparse during the opening 20 minutes but Harry Byrne reduced the deficit to a two-point with two penalties. The Warriors, however, carried a far superior threat with ball in hand, and Sebastian Cassiglieri added a brilliant second try. The Argentinian winger made the initial break before popping the ball off to Gregor Brown, who carried for 15 metres before being tackled. But Cassiglieri provided the support run to collect the offload and dived over in the corner. It was a brilliant finish, but referee Craig Evans had to review the incident on the big screen, but after considerable 
deliberation, deliberation he awarded the try. Although Leinster were missing several key players, they were a formidable side and they demonstrated their resilience by scoring their first try on 30 minutes. Glasgow's defended their try line well, initially under heavy pressure, but the resistance finally ended when Jack Boyle managed to ground the ball. Leinster's try arrived through sheer force and perseverance, but Glasgow responded quickly through a moment of improvisation. James Doby was caught releasing his pass and it fell short of McDowell, but he reacted brilliantly to produce a spinning kick that bounced perfectly, perfectly into the hands of his fellow centre Hugh Jones to score. Glasgow capped an excellent first half with a bonus point when Hook Angus Fraser powered over from a mault for a try on debut. Warriors head coach Franco Smith intimated that he wanted his side to become a renowned, as renowned for the defensive ability as their attacking flair, and the early signs were positive as they produced a monumental effort to resist sustained pressure to preserve the 11-point lead at the break. Leinster were a shadow of the side that reached the Champions Cup final last season in the first half, but they improved considerably after half-time, and Lee Barron added their second try. Only four points separated the sides when Cancellieri was sin-binned for a deliberate knock-on, and it looked ominous for Glasgow, but George Horn stepped up in style. Horn entered the field for his 100th Warrior appearance in 51 minutes, and he scored with just his second touch as Scotland Scotston erupted. Leinster failed to score a single point with their man advantage after Ref Evans adjudged that Liam Turner had been tackled into touch after a lengthy review. The visitors looked to have set up a nervy final eight minutes when Tommy O'Brien finished excellently to make it a four-point game, but Johnny Matthews replicated his try-scoring feat at the World Cup before Evans awarded a late try to seal a superb win for Glasgow. The team was Glasgow, Kebble, Macbeth 51, Fraser Matthews 51, Fagerson Sardoni 59, Patterson Cummings Samuel 75, Brown Gordon 63, Dodge Venter Miller 51, Dobie Jordan Weir 75, Stein Horn 51, McDowell Jones Cancellieri and Mackay. The tries were by Mackay at 12, Cancellieri at 20, Jones 32, Fraser 37, Horn 52, Matthews 77, and there was a penalty try at 78 minutes. Yellow card for Cancellieri at 48 minutes. Leinster were Frawley, O'Brien and Turner, with Prendergast swapping at 66. Nagati, Larmour, Byrne, McGrath and Foley swapping with McGrath at 50. Boyle and McCarthy 50, swapping at 50. McKee and Barron swapping at 25. Clarkson, Maguire at 50. Maloney, Jenkins, Deeney at 50. Deegan, Penny with Connors swapping at 73. Calhane and Ruddock at 50. Tries were by Boyle at 28 minutes. Barron at 44, O'Brien at 68, and the penalties were 2 by Byrne. Yellow card Lamour at 73 minutes and Deeney at 78. That, as we said, was an article by Ewan Booth Robertson, and you can contact Ewan on X, formerly known as Twitter, at E-U-A-N-B-R-O-B. E-R-T-S-O-N. That's Ewan B. Robertson. This is Alistair standing in for Bill, who unfortunately is in hospital this week. And as you'll hear me saying, we wish him well and a speedy return. That concludes this week's edition of the Glasgow Times Sports Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Q&Review and to tell your friends about our service.